Good morning. Thank you for coming uh, again. Uh, you did this for us last year, and uh, the students uh, really got a lot out of it, so I wanted to make sure these, this group had a chance to hear from you. Um, as you know, I've got some specific things that I want to ask you, but I think it would be helpful for the students to hear uh, just briefly from you the basic arc of your, of your career, the kinds of things that you've done and, and are now doing. It's a little intimidating. How many people have we got in here? Uh, about 170. Wow, good class. When I started law school at Mercer, we had 91, I think, graduated 72, something like that. That was back in 1974. My father had graduated from Mercer Law School in 1948, in that uh, famous uh, post-World War II class, along with Griffin Bell and Buck Melton and lots of other uh, famous uh, lawyers in Macon and Georgia. Um, out of law school, I went to work at a firm called O'Neill, uh, excuse me, Adams O'Neill, Hemingway, Kaplan, Stone, and Brown. About 15 lawyers, I was assigned to the litigation division. Uh, there it was my privilege to work with Hank O'Neill, who I will probably quote at some stage. I usually quote Hank at least once a day, so I may as well do it in this class. I'm sure I will. And with Manly Brown, who I also tend to quote regularly. Um, some of you may have met Manly. He teaches the trial ad course, as he has for 39 years, I believe that's right. Um, we did litigation of uh, all types, but primarily it was personal injury and wrongful death. Did some criminal work early in my career, like most young lawyers do, or certainly did at that time. Uh, I did that uh, in the big firm for about three or four years, and then the firm split into three smaller firms. We had a litigation division, a property division, a commercial division, and each division became a separate law firm. So I was with Hank and Manley, and it transitioned into O'Neill, Brown, and Sizemore, and that was the law firm I practiced with until January of 2001. At that point, I was appointed to the Superior Court bench in this circuit. Uh, did that for 10 years, and now I'm back practicing law with Sal and Melton. Yeah, I want to talk first about your time in private practice before you went on the bench. And you, as you said, you spent your time, for the most part, representing plaintiffs in uh, personal injury and wrongful death cases. Uh, I wonder if you could talk with the students a little bit about the uh, what you really liked about that? I mean, what was it that gave you the most satisfaction in that particular kind of practice? Well, the, the people that you represented really were not able to help themselves. They didn't know anything about insurance law. They certainly didn't know anything about litigation. Now, these were not people that were perennially involved in litigation like big businesses are. Certainly not like insurance companies are. Uh, so they were dependent on you, uh, totally dependent on you. And it was what Hank used to refer to as a people practice. And because they were totally dependent on you, when the day was arrived where you had concluded the case and you were ready to close the case, you had clients who actually appreciated what you did, thanked you. And that doesn't always happen in litigation. You will find uh, particularly if you're representing businesses, I mean, it's just business. They expect you to win every time. So if you win, you know, you've just done your job. Sometimes you'll get thanks, other times you won't. But generally, if you're representing individuals and people who are totally dependent on you, they appreciate what you do for them. And they're many times impoverished and uneducated and, you know, but for you or someone like you, they'd never be able to uh, assert their claims and, uh, and have their rights protected. So that's what I enjoyed about this. Obviously, this is a class that is, as you know, about professionalism for lawyers. And um, the students are seeing you know, lawyers in different kinds of practice areas and the issues that they face. What kinds of issues did you see? 
uh, in uh, the personal injury plaintiff side, what kinds of issues did you see that you would classify as professionalism issues? Uh, well, there's a lot of competition for plaintiff's cases. How many times have you turned on TV and seen a commercial, uh, I can turn your wreck into a check. Uh, you, know, you see that sort of thing every day on television. Uh, I have issues with advertising, uh, but particularly advertising like that. I'm not saying it's necessarily an ethical issue, but it certainly can be if there's any false advertising. Um, runners, you know, you hear that expression. Uh, you know, plaintiffs are, well, lawyers are supposed to get their cases, particularly plaintiff's cases, through the referrals of other lawyers or other satisfied clients. I mean, ideally, that's the way lawyers historically have gotten their clients. And, um, and that's the way that it should be. But some lawyers will hire runners who will um, read about a case, a wreck, They'll go out, take photographs of the vehicles, and get those to the lawyer, and uh, maybe have the runner call the victim and say, "Look, you know, I work for so and so. We've already started a little work on that. I happened by there and saw the vehicles, took a few pictures, so we've already got a bit of a head start. Do you want my lawyer to represent you? I mean, that sort of thing. I've even had situations where." Um, a secretary would call someone in the hospital and say, I, I work with lawyer so-and-so. A member of your family, whose name I don't remember right now, has called and asked us to come down and see you and uh, undertake to represent you in this case. And of course the patient is sitting there uh, trying to figure out whether to do this or not. It's just another way of trying to fraudulently um, inject yourself into somebody else's life and and get hold of their case. Uh, but I've seen that so I've seen uh, situations where a client would call us from the hospital, uh, somebody who maybe we had represented or some family member uh, we had represented in the past and ask us to come see them and they hand us another lawyer's card that was handed to them or slipped into their paperwork by someone in the emergency room. Well, that sort of thing's not supposed to happen. Uh, but it does. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, you see in the plaintiff's business this competition, uh, this, this effort to, to get hold of a good case by any means, even as I view it, selling your soul to do it. For this week, as I mentioned to you, the, the students have. have listen to me, an uh, online lecture about civility, you know, they've got a hypothetical this week dealing with discovery in what is really a personal injury type uh, of case. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your relationships with the defense bar. I assume you would tend to see some of the same lawyers over and over again, uh, and talk a little bit about what that's like to have somebody on the other side of the table whose job it is to see that you fail. Yeah. It's an odd way to make a living, isn't it? It is. It sure is. Uh, I always made it my goal to get along with the defense lawyers. And, uh, and one of the things I would do if I didn't know this defense lawyer, say it was somebody in Atlanta, I'd go to Martindale and I'd look to see who was in that firm and read up a little bit on this lawyer. And then I'd go ahead and call the lawyer. Um, generally what happens is you file your lawsuit, an answer comes in, for the first time, you see who's defending the case. That's when I would do a little research on the lawyer and pick up the phone and just call. Introduce myself. Uh, if we got something in common, particularly if this was a Mercer graduate, for example, I'd make a point of discussing that. If I knew somebody in that firm, we'd talk about that person. Then we'd begin to talk a little bit about the case, and I would suggest that we try to find a time and few weeks when, three or four weeks when we could sit down and begin to map out a plan for discovery that would accommodate everybody. So you get to know this person and then 
you know, occasionally I have uh, made that trip to Atlanta, always offered to come to Atlanta to have this meeting. Occasionally we'll take them to lunch. And it's a little hard to, you always hear the expression about breaking bread with people and then it's hard to have a falling out with somebody you shared a meal with. Well, that's true. Uh, but I made it a goal to get along with them because it inures to my benefit and my client's benefit to do that. Uh, but you can't get along with every lawyer. I mean, there's some people who are just, uh, well, I've heard the expression cross-grained. That's one that Manley likes to use. Somebody you just cannot get along with. I'll give you an example. Um, a good friend of mine named Rusty Simpson, who's a Mercer graduate, lawyer down in Tifton. We were involved in some litigation uh, with a lawyer from Atlanta. Had nothing to do with the fact that he was from Atlanta. It just happened to be from Atlanta. Uh, during the course of a deposition, uh, we were representing our client who was being deposed by the lawyer from Atlanta. And it was Rusty's client. He had asked me to help him, so I was sitting there with him. The lawyer on the other side was asking a question of our client. Rusty objected and said, I don't understand the question, so I'm not going to let her answer the question. He said, well, frankly, Mr. Simpson, I don't care whether you understand it. I want to know whether she understands it. Well, that just set Rusty off. And Rusty said, well, she's not going to answer it until I understand the question. So the fellow tries to explain his question again, asks it again, and Rusty still objects. Well, this fellow then stands up and says, Simpson, I have explained it to you in English. I'll do it in German if that'll help. And Simpson, not to be outdone, leans over the table and says, well, by God, I'll spreck him with you. And they start shouting at each other in German. The reporter is feverish for trying to take this down phonetically. Finally, just throws her hands up and quits. And I'm, I'm time out, time out. And so I take our client, whose eyes were about this big, as you can imagine, took her and Rusty outside and left this other lawyer sitting there. Well. The other lawyer did it because he knew he could provoke Rusty. And many times we worked on cases, my job was to keep Rusty under control. He was such a bulldog and he would uh, rise to the occasion when he was provoked like, uh, like he was that day. Uh, but uh, it was nonetheless my goal to get along with lawyers. So I was the one who tried to get along with that particular lawyer and uh, smooth things over. But you will find that there's some people, and he was one of them, that no matter how hard you try, you just cannot get along with. And uh, you have to um, do the best that you can. My, my view of it was that you um, agree on whatever you can agree on and make life easy. But if you can't agree, then you just observe the formalities. And that's what the Civil Practice Act provides you, is formalities. So if you can get along, you make life easier for yourself, you make life easier for your client, you agree on when you take depositions and where and at what time. You don't insist that you take them at 7.30 in the morning and make them with a lawyer having to drive from Atlanta. Um, you do what you can to accommodate. You hope that they will treat you the same way. Remember an insurance adjuster called me, and this was over a personal thing. My daughter driving home from a youth group at church uh, one Sunday evening had a girl from all, well, an Allstate uh, vehicle came through a traffic light and hit her. I told the adjuster, look, all I want to do is get it fixed. Fortunately, my daughter wasn't hurt. I would like, though, to go ahead and get the whole car painted. We can do that in lieu of the difference in fair market value, which I would otherwise be entitled to. And he launched into cussing me and uh, describing me with all sorts of uh, pejoratives, um, knowing I was a lawyer. Uh, so uh, he always ended up with that fact that I was a lawyer, one of those lawyers. And I said, wait a minute, we do not have to have this conversation. And we certainly don't have to talk to each other this way. 
we do it as I've suggested, or I'll just go forward with the, the case. And he said, no, you're going to have to deal with me. I said, no, sir. When I file that lawsuit and I serve it on your insured, I'm going to be dealing with your lawyer. And we can get along, and that's fine. There's no need for that lawsuit. But I, I don't have to be cussed like that. And fortunately, the law provides for a system of rules, and they're embodied in the Civil Practice Act. And I'll just observe the formalities from this point on. And I've had to use that uh, once or twice with other lawyers um, who just want to argue and then want to go beyond arguing and become uncivil. And again, all you have to do is just remind them, look, we get along and make life easy for everybody, or we just observe the formalities. And that's sort of been my rule in dealing with people. Right, and I've talked to the students about uh, what we used to call in Texas, you can find we'll play it by the book. Yeah. Right? And yeah. that's the same thing. I mean, there is a book, mm -hmm. after all, and, and, and the Civil Practice Act is what we're talking about. Um, we're talking about this basically uncivil conduct, discourtesy, lack of cooperation, and so on. You mentioned one reason why this lawyer um, treated Rusty that way was really strategic. I mean, he mm -hmm. wanted to promote him. Why else do you suppose lawyers act like this? Uh, well, to get an advantage, and that's what he was trying to do. I mean, everybody in litigation wants an advantage. Uh, we've had, uh, you get into particularly with a product liability case, and everybody's going to have experts. And they insist, well, we want to do the plaintiffs and the plaintiffs' experts, and then you can take our people's deposition and our experts' depositions. Well, you know, I know you want to have a, uh, an advantage. Everybody wants an advantage in litigation, but there's no reason in the world why we can't schedule the plaintiffs' depositions and the defendants' depositions the same day. Then we can do the experts uh, you know, within a day or two of each other or have our experts present when the other sides expert is deposed I and mean, there are ways to do that, but you will have people that will just stand you down and want to fight over that. And I, it's to gain an advantage. Um, I had a, uh, well this was a classmate of mine too, it's what's always burned me I think about, about this, one of my good class of 74 classmates. We've been out of school about five years I guess. And one of the senior people in my firm brought me a lawsuit, it was a big deal. Uh, an automobile dealership had sued our client for some repairs to a car that he had not paid. And it was on the 28th, 29th day that he finally brought it in to my senior partner who uh, asked me to take a look at it. <coughs> so I saw who filed the complaint and I thought well my good friend and classmate so I called up and said look I just got this I'm gonna need a couple of days to get into it may need to do a little research may need to file a counterclaim just let you know um, can you give me about three days um, and then I'll, I'll get an answer and counterclaim filed if we're gonna do a counterclaim he said well you know I'd be glad to do that I just have to run it by my client well, I was too young then and inexperienced to know that uh, lawyers don't have to run that sort of thing by their client, at least they ought not to. Uh, any client who's that much in control of the lawyer uh, may as well be the lawyer. Um, but good lawyering allows you the freedom to make those kinds of decisions. And you accommodate somebody and they accommodate you later on. Uh, well, I said, fine, and uh, I'll call you back. So I called him back that afternoon. He wasn't there and left a message with his secretary. Called back about 4 o'clock. She said, yeah, he got the message, but he's had to run over to probate court. I said, well, fine, just let him give me a call in the morning. Well, about 10 o'clock, I called again and got his secretary. He said, well, he had to run out to Jones County. But he's got your message. He's going to give you a call. Well, about 2 o'clock, now this is the next to the last day, uh, left another message. 
And then the following morning I went through that exercise, still tending to other business that I had already scheduled. Finally, by noon on the last day, the 30th day, it was obvious that he was not going to return my phone call. So I just canceled everything that I had that afternoon, and I spent the afternoon in the library and dictating a, an answer and counterclaim, which I got filed. And to this good day, I have never had one of those messages returned. <coughs> you know, this, this is my friend that did this to me. Well, I'll tell you, he went on what Hank O'Neill used to refer to as the list. Yeah. He went on the list, uh, as did that lawyer that Rusty had his uh, uh, German exercise with, because there was a lot going on besides just the German incident, uh, speaking German. But these people are on what Hank used to refer to as the list. It's not one you write down, you, you keep it up here. And people on that list can move up, they move down, but they never come off the list. And the reason is, they have shown you that they can't be trusted. Um, and so you have to take advantage of that knowledge you have and be forewarned in your dealings with them in the future. Doesn't mean that you get even, it doesn't mean that you go out and tell the world what they've done or how unprofessional they are or how unethical they may be, how miserable they've made your lives. The point is, you are forewarned. And, uh, and when you deal with them, you observe the formalities. And uh, so O'Neill's list was something that I, and some of the lawyers I've dealt with in the 10 years on the bench are familiar with the list. Nobody wanted to get on that list. They'd heard about the list. <laughs> but but, uh, but there, I will say this, in 30, gosh, I'm coming up on 37 years at the bar, I mean, there are probably less than a half dozen people on that list. And uh, depending on how things go, as I say, they can move down on that list or they can move up on that list, but they never come off the list. And I haven't practiced law in almost 20 years. And I could still tell you the people on my list. And for all I know, they're dead and gone. But uh, they're still they're yeah. still on that list. But the, the fact that there's such a, a small number of people on that list really takes me to the one thing I wanted to ask you quickly. Because if, if I were sitting up in, in their seats and I hear these stories, I would think, you know, what have I gotten myself into? I and mean, is this going to be my daily life? Uh, this is a small slice of your life as a lawyer, right? I mean, the, for the most part, I mean, how would you describe your relationships with, with other lawyers and litigation over the years, for the most part? I'd rather spend my time with lawyers than any group of people I know. Um, the camaraderie of lawyers uh, sitting around telling war stories, uh, which you will uh, enjoy as time goes by. Particularly sitting with older lawyers and listening to their war stories. Uh, you talk about fun particularly if there's scotch whiskey involved. <laughs> they are a lot of fun sitting and, and learning at the, the, the knees of these masters. Uh, we might call them uh, masters of the bench in the ends of court, but these uh, older lawyers who have experienced so much more than you have and from whom you can learn. Which brings me to mentoring. Yeah, but you haven't asked me about that. I'm sure it's on your list. Well, it is. And, and especially since you've been quoting Hank O'Neill and, and Manley Brown, and, and I think this is yeah. a real good point for you to talk about. That. I will tell you the most important thing in a young career uh, out of law school is a mentor. You can read all day long about the law. Uh, you can um, go to seminars all day long. Uh, you can learn bits and pieces. But having someone that you can sit down and talk to about real life legal issues, client issues, uh, opposite lawyer kinds of adversary issues, strategy, things that, you know, come from litigation, from experience, um, that's the most valuable um, 
tool for completing your education. So I encourage you to keep this in mind. I know you're not there yet, but when you graduate from law school, and when I've sworn in new lawyers at the courthouse uh, every November, I've said every single year for 10 years, the first thing you do when you leave here is find yourself a mentor. Um, I'm talking about somebody with some, not just any older lawyer. I mean, do a little investigation. I mean, find out, uh, you know, who are the, the sort of the deans of the bar? Who are the people with the, the sort of experience and reputation that you would want to uh, align yourself with? You may not be able to practice law with them. I mean, that may not be in the cards for one reason or another. But explore the possibility of having a mentor, protege, or mentee, I think I've heard them say, a relationship with this person. The state bar has a mentoring program. The Macon Bar has a great tradition of older lawyers helping younger lawyers. And then as the younger lawyers become older lawyers, they return that favor by mentoring younger lawyers. Uh, so I tell new lawyers, uh, find yourself a mentor, and if you can't find one, call me or one of the other judges, and we will find you a mentor. Because you need to be able to talk over ethical issues, strategy issues, and that sort of thing with older lawyers and get the benefit of their experience. Um, I have, uh, at one time in my career, was part of the State Bar's disciplinary process. And I was serving on the review panel. And you have an investigative panel that hears complaints, receives complaints about lawyer misconduct does an investigation and sort of like a grand jury determines whether there's probable cause to go forward with this ethical investigation, which can result ultimately in disbarment or some lesser form of punishment. They have a special master appointed who hears the evidence, makes a recommendation, um, makes a recommendation for punishment, and um, then the lawyer can appeal that, and I was on the review panel that would hear those appeals. And I can tell you almost without fail, the people, uh, the lawyers whose uh, conduct landed them in that disciplinary process, at least the ones I saw at the review panel, if you look at their background, they just went out and hung a shingle and went to work. I admired them <laughs> for doing that, but the downside is they didn't have the mentoring that they needed, and it landed them and some ethical problem that they didn't realize was, was facing. But if you'd had a mentor to talk to, somebody to ask about these things, then you would have avoided. And these were not people who set out maliciously uh, always to do these things, uh, though some of them had and didn't need to be practicing law. Many of them were people who were just not properly mentored and didn't know what they were supposed to do. Well, as you, as you mentioned, the State Bar now has a mandatory mentoring program for uh, anybody who becomes a member of the Georgia Bar. Uh, Doug Ashworth, who's the director of that program, will be here in about two and a half weeks uh, to talk to the students about that and about his, uh, his take on uh, professionalism. <coughs> you mentioned your time on the um, uh, review panel, which makes me want to ask you this. I know you've spent a lot of time involved in state bar activities, a member of the Board of Governors for years and years, uh, recent past president of our local end of court. Uh, uh, and so you've spent a lot of time and energy in organized bar activities and things like that. Um, could you talk a little bit about why and, and what, what you got out of that personally and professionally to spend that amount of time on? Uh, I was invited really at a young age, uh, I hadn't been out of law school very long, to become uh, involved in the Macon Bar. And I did, and eventually, you know, you sort of work your way up that ladder and become the president of the bar. And then uh, a good friend of mine was on the Board of Governors and was at the State Bar and was stepping down, not running again. And so he encouraged me, and I did. Spent 20 years on the State Bar's Board of Governors. Um, 
I've been involved in the Middle Georgia Trial Lawyers, the Ends of Court, uh, Georgia Trial Lawyers Association, the uh, Association of Trial Lawyers of America, the, uh, of course, the ABA. And all of that has been personally rewarding, but it's also been professionally rewarding. You know, when you take an oath to become a lawyer and you're uh, encouraged to read the Supreme Court's um, aspirational goals for lawyers, uh, you see that you have a duty. You're reminded that you have a duty uh, to improve the administration of justice and the science of law, as it's referred to, I think, in the, in the aspiration. And the best way I know of to do that is to do things like teaching, like Professor Longin, um, be an adjunct faculty member, you know, come when you have opportunities to talk to law students about law and practice of law. Being involved in those organizations that uh, govern the bar and hopefully uh, help it change in the right ways as society changes. And it's been rewarding personally because of the friendships that have developed in these various associations. Um, I think I could go just about anywhere in Georgia, uh, have a, uh, a car break down and be able to pick up the phone and call a lawyer within 10 miles of where I am. And, and know him personally and have him uh, you know, help me out. I've had to do that on occasion too in my travels around the state. But that's through you know, working with lawyers on various committees. And uh, so I, I encourage you to do it because it helps improve the administration of justice and the, the bar itself, but it also uh, helps you in your education about the law and certainly in the relationships. You, know, you spent obviously a number of years in, in private practice and the time came that, that you had the opportunity to go on the bench uh, and become a judge uh, and you've just completed 10 years of service uh, on the on the bench. And I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about about that experience and what uh, what made you want to become a judge and what your reactions were once you were actually uh, in the job about that. And, maybe observations you made about lawyers uh, from that side that may be different from what you had in private practice. Uh, if there is a lawyer who tries cases and hasn't at one time or another thought, I wonder if I could do that job, I wonder if I could be a judge, then I'd like to meet him. I, I can't imagine a trial lawyer who hasn't at one time or another thought about that. You know, I did, certainly, as a young lawyer, trying cases and watching judges. Um, in about 1988, I got involved in mediation, back before mediation was, was a popular thing. In fact, it was five years before the Supreme Court of Georgia even enacted rules governing the registration, training, and that sort of thing of mentors. And I got to work with lawyers and their clients in resolving their cases. And it was rewarding to me uh, to be able to help lawyers. I mean, again, I'm, I'm telling you, the most collegial group of people I know are lawyers, except those on your list. Uh, those are, they're not collegial. Uh, but, I mean, I, I would rather spend my time with lawyers than, any, as I said, any group I know. And to be able to help lawyers, work with lawyers, to resolve their cases, their clients' cases, get them a little further down the road with their cases is a good feeling, or it was to me. So I'm practicing law, I'm mediating whenever I'm asked to do so, and the opportunity arises to uh, go to the Superior Court bench when a good friend of mine, a fellow who was in my Sunday school class, Judge Walter Johnson, when he suddenly died, um, and I thought, well, you know, I'm at the age where my kids are thoroughly educated and uh, the first one was married and the second one about to be married. I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to do it, now's the time to do it. I'm 52 years old. And, uh, and I had never done that. And I had taught law at 
that time I guess for 21 years um, as an adjunct faculty. I had been a trial lawyer, I had been a mediator, I had been an arbitrator. I certainly had never been a judge and, uh, and like again, trial lawyers, uh, I wanted to do that. And I, and I, I saw it as sort of an extension of what I was doing when I was mediating. That is helping lawyers resolve their cases. Um, helping people who are in crisis, and litigants are, uh, by and large. Particularly if you're talking about domestic cases, which were the bane of my existence the last two years. But nonetheless, those are people who needed help uh, and were in crisis more than just about any others in the courthouse. So I wanted to be part of that. And I had uh, the Opel 14 who actually put in for the job, and through the process, I was lucky enough to be the one who was appointed. And I served two years by appointment, then I had an election, and fortunately ran unopposed and had four years, and had another election, fortunately, again unopposed, four more years, so a full ten years on the bench. Now, I'm talking about the lawyers I deal with, one of the greatest disappointments to me um, was the, um, the disparity in legal skills that I saw. And that's just the reality of the world. I mean, they're good lawyers, experienced lawyers, they're um, lawyers not really suited for trial work by virtue of their personality or maybe their background. But the disparity that I saw uh, was a bit of a shock to me. And other judges had told me, experienced judges had told me that I would would find that and that would be the biggest shock and it, and it was. Um, well, I probably I'll let you ask the next what, question before what, I go on though. I don't want to take you down another. No, no, that's fine. Uh, it, what did you like best about it? I mean, it, <laughs> it, it couldn't have been exactly what you expected. No, I, you I, like best I loved working with the lawyers. You know, I mean that to me was the best part. Just like when I mediated, I'm working with the lawyers. That was the best part. The the uh, the second, uh, I guess you would say, best part would be um, helping, knowing that you're helping people who are in crisis get beyond the crisis. Um, whether that means uh, having a hearing in a domestic relations case and trying to figure out how on a temporary basis to let them get a little farther down the road until this thing can be finalized. Trying to explain to them, as I would my clients when I was in law practice, why I think it needs to be done this way, uh, what the benefits are to you and to you by doing it this way. You know, just trying to help people get through a crisis. Well, you recently did something that really is very unusual, uh, and that is that you, um, at a time when you are young enough and vigorous enough to continue uh, in office uh, for a good bit of time, you decided uh, not to seek uh, re-election and, and to go back into practice. Could you talk a little bit about that decision and about uh, what went into it and about what you're doing now? Sure. Um, ten years uh, in a career, I guess, maybe it's not all that long. I mean, I hope I'm going to be part of our profession for 50 years at least. Um, but ten years of sending people to the penitentiary, ten years of deciding who's going to take the children home at night, uh, will begin to wear on you. And I think it wears on different people just based on their personalities and their past experience um, and how, you know, how uh, diligently they work or how they may uh, view the work. But 10 years was plenty uh, for me. I could have gone on, but I think the worst thing that can happen to a judge is to get to the point where you no longer view every case separate and apart from every other case but instead you begin to treat this divorce or this child custody 
case like the last one and the one before that and the one before that. Or this criminal case, like the one the last murder case you tried, is just like the one before that and the one before. If you stop taking them individually and focusing on them and focusing the same energy on this one that you did on the one before and before and before, then you're not being fair to the litigants, and uh, and it, it affects the system. And so I, you can have burnout, I think, uh, in this profession. Certainly, uh, whether it's law practice, my son nearly burned out in the big city after 10 years, and now he's in Anderson, South Carolina, having a ball uh, practicing law. After clerking two years for a federal judge, two years at King and Spaulding, and four years with another um, international firm with an office in Atlanta, you can burn out. And, uh, and, and I have seen judges who have burned out, and I didn't want to do that. Um, and I still missed uh, mediation. I got to mediate a little bit through the 10 years for other judges who had cases that they thought, you know, one last shot at a settlement conference might do it and get this case resolved. And so they'd call me and I would, would handle that for them. And I always enjoyed those. But I missed doing it on a more regular basis. Well, I missed having, at the end of the day, Having worked with the lawyers and talked with the clients, seeing people shake hands across the table and leave happy uh, about the outcome and generally happy with one another. You don't get that at the courthouse. You know, I mean, somebody wins and somebody loses ordinarily. And uh, so I missed that. I missed the camaraderie of working with lawyers. You know, uh, no matter how much I tried to be one of the lawyers, one of the guys, you know, when I'm on the bench, uh, when we're not in the courtroom, there is still that divide, and uh, it needs to be there. I mean, there's a reason for it. It's just like enlisted men and officers in the in the military. And there is a reason for that divide, uh, but. Uh, I really longed for that personal relationship with lawyers feeling close. I never really got over feeling like I was a lawyer wearing a robe, you know, and that's not quite the same as being, feeling like a judge. And uh, so I'm back doing what I enjoy doing and I've experienced the other and it was a wonderful experience. It opened my eyes to a lot of what goes on in our community that uh, I had no clue was going on. Not only that, it gave me the opportunity to sit on the Georgia Supreme Court one day and hear one case as a member of that court, to see those marble doors slide to the side from the robing room and not from the courtroom. And what an experience that was. But one time was plenty. <laughs> <laughs> Judge, I'm going to uh, invite the students momentarily to ask you anything they want to ask you, but you have a captive audience, uh, and uh, I want to give you the opportunity if there's anything in particular you want to make sure that they hear, uh, let me serve that up for you, uh, and then I'll turn it over to them and let them ask what they want to go back. Okay, the only thing I would say, you know, I think this is probably juvenile, but I have had... Um, in the 10 years that I was at the courthouse, probably 30, uh, 34 or five interns, thanks to Professor Longin, and law clerks. And at the end of every um, internship or clerkship, uh, I would give the law clerk a uh, hardbound copy of To Kill a Mockingbird. Everybody's read it may have read it more than once. But I would always write in there, among other things, that I encourage you and every other lawyer to read this book every five years or so just to remind yourself of the example of Atticus Finch. Uh, and I do the same thing. I read it again last summer along with a book that was written um, 
sort of a series of essays about that book written by scholars and other writers. Um, yeah, I wrote down the number 34 law clerks. It's <coughs> and I look back this morning at something that has always <laughs> stuck with me. In that book, there is a point at which Miss Maltie, the neighbor who's a good friend of Atticus Finch and his family, uh, talks to Jim after the trial. Everybody in town's down on Atticus. You know, he shouldn't have taken that case, and you know, look what he's done. And, um, nobody's happy with Atticus. And Jim's being ridiculed by all of his friends and being called names. And he's walking down the sidewalk with Miss Maudie. And he's complaining about all this. And why did Atticus do this? And, you know, look what he's brought down on the family and, and all. And she looks at him and says, Jim, there's some men in this world who were born to do our unpleasant jobs for us, and your father's one of them. And that's always stuck with me from the first time I read this book, thinking about lawyers. We do have to do some of the unpleasant things uh, in society for people, for the good of people and the good of our community. And uh, I just particularly like that. Uh, uh, my dad as I said, was a lawyer. I can remember people coming by and sitting on the patio in the evening with him, asking him advice. Neighbors, uh, from up, people from the church would drive over to spend an hour or two with him on the back uh, on the patio. He even put in, sort of reminded me of something Atticus would have done at the time if he lived in the, in the 60s. My dad put a separate telephone line in at the house when he had teenagers occupying the telephone so that his clients could get to him at night. And he gave that number out to his clients. And it was his business line at home that he was always available to them. What questions do you all have for, for the judge? Yes, sir. How hard is it um, coming from being a lawyer to going on the bench to stay impartial after hearing some like a some horrid allegations or some, like how, is, how hard is it to stay in the middle and not take sides? Well, that was one of the beautiful things about doing mediation before I got there. So I had been an advocate and I've been representing people and arguing aside, but during that period of, I guess it would have been about 12 or 13 years that I was a mediator and arbitrator as part of my law practice, I was in that role of being a neutral, which is what a judge is, or supposed to be, a neutral. And uh, so I didn't find the transition too hard. And people, lawyers were calling me to mediate because they had the sense that even though I was a plaintiff's lawyer, I could be objective about their case. And, um, and that's what I tried to do as a judge, is just be objective. Um, I had um, three rules. Uh, as a judge. The first, I came to this early on, is uh, remember that first you were a lawyer. If I'm giving advice to a, a new judge, for example, I would say remember that first you were a lawyer. In other words, remember what it's like to have a bunch of clients, people calling you at home, who are in crisis and they're looking to you to handle it. And at the same time, you've got to be in 12 different counties every week, you know, and different trial calendars, different judges. And if you ever lose uh, the, the memory of what it's like to be a lawyer, then two lawyers, you become a tyrant. I mean, you just, by gosh, you're going to be here. When I say be, you're going to sit all day long until I finally get to your case. But you can't leave this room until I get to your case, even if it's 6 o'clock tonight. You know, you become a tyrant uh, as opposed to trying to accommodate lawyers. So, I mean, that was my first rule going in, to remember what it was like to be a lawyer and never forget that. Second, and particularly in criminal cases, when in doubt, err on the side of mercy. And I believe that uh, it's almost like the golden rule uh, for judges. Uh, if you're in doubt 
And then there's some cases, I mean, I've sentenced people to 90 years before they're eligible for parole. People who do not ever need to set foot on a public street or sidewalk. Uh, people who are dangerous, obviously. Uh, but if I ever had a doubt about it, then I would always remind myself to err on the side of mercy and go light. But there would be some probationary time so that if you know, if he didn't live up to the obligation he made to me when I imposed this sentence, then there would be a way to deal with it. But give him the benefit of the doubt. My view in sentencing was always give that person some sense of hope that things were going to be better. I mean, I didn't lecture defendants. Um, some judges do, and, and you know, that's fine. I mean, I'm not being critical of that. But for me, uh, <clears throat> to talk down to somebody who's not in a position at that point to defend himself against the power of the court, to talk down to somebody, to belittle somebody, um, is being like a bully. And I just didn't feel comfortable doing that. So I didn't do that. But I would always try to say, you know, as a condition of your probation, I'm going to uh, see that you're enrolled in a drug and alcohol rehabilitation program. Uh, I'm going to have a special condition of your probation be that you have to get a GED. It's not punishment. It's so that it'll be easier for you to get a job when you get out. You know, there's something we're going to do to help you. You know, your life's going to be better. You're going to have a better chance. Um, err on the side of mercy. And then finally, the last rule, and the one that my daughter put on a ceramic piece that she did is two words, just rule. Just rule. Uh, I can't tell you how many times as a lawyer I used to say, I don't care whether this judge rules with me or against me. I just wish he'd rule. He would just rule. I can't go anywhere until this judge rules. And some judges are just paralyzed by indecision, or you've got a file this thick, briefs and exhibits this thick, and you know you can be intimidated by that. And um, you know I've known some judges to sit for years on a case. I argued a motion to suppress evidence in a criminal case in February of 1976. We were going to have a ruling by Friday. Then the trial calendar came out three weeks later, and I announced ready subject to my motion. Case rolled on, came off the calendar. Two months later, back on the calendar, ready subject to my motion. Well, to this good day, the judge has never ruled on my motion <laughs> to suppress up. That was frustrating to the DA, of course, it inured to my client's benefit, and ultimately they just null crossed or dismissed the case because uh, it was that close a question. But that judge was just paralyzed by the issue, and he could not decide it. So, uh, you know, there's another friend of mine, Bob Hicks, who, who you know, another Bursa graduate in the era of my father, said the raison d'etre of a judge reason for being for a judge is to rule. And if you can't do that, you don't need to be a judge. So the ultimate rule was just rule. Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, as a judge, how did you feel about uh, mandatory, uh, mandatory minimum sentencing in criminal cases? Did you feel like it took away some of your discretion? I, yeah, I, I hate that. Um, you know, the you take out the, the human element, that is a judge exercising discretion. A judge that, what we're talking about are certain types of crimes where there is a minimum mandatory punishment. Um, regardless of the facts that give rise to it, if you're convicted or you plea to this crime, you have to serve a minimum mandatory period of time in, in prison, maybe 10 years. And usually that's sort of the minimum of those 
uh, offenses. Uh, but it's without regard to um, the facts of the particular case. I mean, I've heard of you know the three strikes you're out kind of legislation that uh, is all over the country. You know, I remember one fellow who took a, an ice cream sandwich from um, a school refrigerator or something, 18 years old, and they arrested him. And he did take it, he didn't have permission to take it. And he ended up with a 10 year sentence of his third offense. It had two legitimate events, but I mean, this was an ice cream sandwich. And he's serving 10 years. Well, you know, they said, well, he, he had the other two, I and mean, you know, he's serving time for those two. Well, that, that may be, but this third one is not an offense that ought to get you in, ought not even, well, stretch to say probation, but certainly not prison time over an ice cream sandwich. Well, that's the, the real danger of minimum mandatory sentencing. It, it takes away the element of a judge who's had the experience of seeing these cases and, and you know, having um, other alternatives available but not being able to use them. I mean, I, I think it's, you know, the worst thing that's happened to, to sentencing. And it's, it's political, and, you know, it's politically popular to do that sort of thing. We're getting tough with crime. But what it means is the legislature is going to decide how much time they spend in jail and not judges, and I think that's a mistake. Well, Judge, I, I would love to continue this, but uh, I think we're out of time. So join me in thanking.